Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am so excited today to be interviewing Ian Michael Hebert, coming to us live from Costa Rica, where you hear the beautiful birds and maybe even toucans in the background. Hi, Ian Michael. Thanks for being with us. Hey, good morning. Morning. So Ian Michael is the CEO and founder of Holos Global, currently building the first Holos retreat center and community in Costa Rica's Diamante Valley. Ian Michael has led a life devoted to creating inspiring spaces for the transformation of individuals, organizations, and society. Through the various projects and initiatives he has been involved in, he consistently demonstrated the capacity to take a diversity of initiatives from vision through manifestation. And you can check out his links here in the show notes and check out Holos. It's a beautiful part of Costa Rica if you've never been. But Ian, Michael, I'm so excited to get to know you and hear your story. Uh, the first question I always ask all my guests is, what was your career path? How did you get to building the dream of a retreat center that so many people dream of? And um, I'm curious, you know, what turns it's taken and how you got yeah. here on this path. I guess when you frame it that way, my mind and imagination went back to my childhood in uh, it was semi-rural Alaska. It was outside of a town called Fairbanks, the golden heart of Alaska. And I was thinking about my first job was like cleaning up my dad's wood shop. And just outside the wood shop were the chickens and the garden and like a beautiful birch forest that I could go enjoy. And so my childhood was like a little mini retreat center uh, that had, you know, farm to table meals and, um, yeah, time in nature, all of those kinds of things. So I had these really early imprints of a world that to me made a lot of sense. It was like where humans and nature were having a conversation every day. And then I became a home builder. My dad was a home builder. So I became a home builder and home designer and built really high efficiency homes in Alaska but I didn't feel like that was the full expression of my dharma in this life. So in my early 20s, I created a, a degree called Eco Resort Design and Development. I was at Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, and we had the liberty to create our own curriculum and piece together different things. So I was really interested in philosophy and agriculture and physics and consciousness. So I wove all those together into a degree. And I worked for a resort in Alaska called China Hot Springs, where we had a geothermal power plant and electrolyzer for creating hydrogen. And we had greenhouses that produced huge amount of tomatoes and lettuce and greens all the way through the winter where there was no sunlight because we had geothermal power and heat. So that was my first like real executive position uh, in the retreat business. And at the same time, I was building houses and I was a community organizer in Alaska. So, uh, but something still was missing. And I thought about going to school for community planning and like master planning of communities and, and towns. And, uh, and I decided to go to school for psychology because I had lost a lot of friends to depression or um, suicide or uh, drug abuse. So... I moved to San Francisco in uh, 2011 and started grad school at CIS Community Institute of uh, or California Institute of Integral Studies, and that's where I really developed this broad knowledge of a lot of different traditions of spirituality as well as psychology that all can be woven together in an integrated approach to to healing. And as I finished my degree becoming to become a therapist, I realized as a father of two kids that it was going to be a little bit hard to make a living in San Francisco as a therapist. There was lots of therapists and it was a high, high cost of living there. So I applied for a job at uh, Esalen Institute in Big Sur, which is one of the like grandmother institutes of transpersonal psychology and somatic psychology and all of these different practices that have emerged from California. And there I was the director of projects. So we did a, a major renovation and expansion of the campus and 
rebuilt the heart of the campus, which is the lodge and dining hall. So that was really, I would say, one of the peaks of my career where I was integrated into a community, into uh, a historic place that also had uh, roots in their in, in the indigenous practices of that place. So Esalen is actually named after the people of, of that region, the Esalen people. They were the first linguistic group in the Americas to go extinct uh, when the conquistadors and the Western expansion happened. And there are still Esalen people that are holding their language and holding some of their traditions. So I developed a really beautiful relationship with that tribe. And I realized that there's this opportunity for retreat centers or for businesses to be part of the reparations of, of, of how humanity has expanded and people have moved all over the globe. And there's this diaspora that we're all a part of. And so I learned a lot at Esalen about the reweaving of our consciousness with, with indigeneity. And I had a sense of it from growing up in Alaska, but I really, I really got a more grounded understanding of what that means being at Esalen. And then also Esalen is the birthplace of a lot of the psychedelic revolution of the sixties and seventies and a lot of research and a lot of the luminaries from the psychedelic world, uh, birthed their practices out of Esalen, including maps came out of a conference that, that was at Esalen. So, um, yeah, that was a really beautiful opportunity for me to see a world that I wanted to live inside of. And as I left Esalen, I started looking for where are the next opportunities to to bring this pattern of, of humans in harmony with each other and with nature. And so, yeah, the birthing of Holos came out of that and came out of my relationship with Stan Groff, who's one of the um, I would say grandfathers of the psychedelic revolution and of transpersonal psychology. And he created a, uh, a practice called holotropic breathwork. So Holos is like a tipping of the hat to his, his realization that there's these many, many practices, infinite number of practices that move us towards wholeness. That's what holotropic means to move towards wholeness. Wow. This is a beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so tell, I, I, I'm curious how, you know, how, how psychedelics or medicines of any sorts came into your path and how it did affect your, you know, building of Holos or this, this career. The, I mean, it sounds like you were already on this path, but, you know, what was your first psychedelic experience and did it shape what you would say your purpose is, your dharma, as you mentioned? Yeah. My first psychedelic experience was probably uh, in junior high, like at age 15, um, or maybe a little bit earlier. And I grew up in Alaska. We were very experimental. And I also had dealt with a very crushing depression uh, in my early teens or, or preteen years. I um, was in a suicidal depression from like 11 to 13. And then I discovered kind of like a, a community of people that were very exploratory, philosophical, and and I started to experiment with psychedelics. So I, yeah, I moved out when I was 17 and um, experienced a lot of psilocybin and saw the world through a new lens of possibilities and of, of freedom from my own suffering. Wow. So, so that was really yeah. the beginning of it, yeah. Yeah. And did these, then your path over the years, how has it been shaped and, um, you know, has it had an influence on, you know, choosing to work at Esalen or, you know, choosing to build the yeah. center of your own? Absolutely. So at 17, I had a very high dose psilocybin experience where I left my body and kind of had a choice of like, do I return to all that is and be part of the universe? Or do I come back to this body that's laying in the forest here? And so I chose to come back to my body. And then I took a 13 year hiatus from psychedelics or anything like drinking or, um, and really focused my life on business and having kids and meditating. And I had a very deep meditation practice for a decade. Um, 
And then it was actually at Esalen that I, I walked back into the psychedelic world. And that's where I started to discover through that community, the traditions of ayahuasca, and the Shipibo people. Um, I learned about the Shaveen and San Pedro. And so there's this very rich history that flows through Esalen. And I had the opportunity to learn about all these traditions and start to study and see the way that they can be very helpful in the healing process. So I had this background in psychology at that point and all of the grounding of that. But then I had this exposure to, oh, wow, there's these tools that we've been gifted uh, that can really assist in the healing process. So. Yeah. Mm, beautiful. Um, I'm just curious, you know, it's funny because my path was quite similar where I started at a, you know, in my teens at 14 and then also took a hiatus, hi- a big hiatus actually after 9-11 because um, I was living in New York City when that happened. And it was, it came back through ceremonial, intentional working with these plant medicines in a totally different realm, you know, about 10, 12 years later, it was the same thing. Um, you know, I'm curious about uh, how your current project is going. Like, maybe you could tell people a little bit about Holos and its vision and mission and what you offer there. Because I was telling Ian Michael, um, so many people that come to me for for you know business coaching, it's it tends to be part of a lot of people's dreams to build a healing center. I mean, this has been my dream since I was a teenager. It's come through where I'm like, I I know there's this feeling in me that wants to be part of community living and have a big center. I don't know what it looks like. I still don't know what it looks like. And who knows if it will happen in my lifetime. But this is so common that it's it's come up for so many people. And there's more and more retreat centers being built, you know, across the world these days. But so tell us yeah. about Holos and how it is maybe different than some other retreat centers. Yeah. Well, I think that we're always growing and evolving as a species and we're we're growing and evolving in how we live on earth. And so retreat centers can be like a window into another way of living and being. So early on, I thought about retreat centers or even hospitality in general as like an opportunity for education. So people come from their normal everyday life or cities And then they come to this novel experience and they experience awe and they experience healing. And in that very like open state, it's like the perfect opportunity to learn about another way to be, to be on earth. So I think there's so many people having this common dream that you just described because we know there's a better way. We know there's a better way to live. So Holos is really meant to be an example and a living laboratory for how we do things differently. And we're learning all along the way. I don't want to give anybody the impression that building a retreat center is simple or easy. Um, The reality is that you bump up against the human condition constantly, which is we have conflict with one another and we have to work out all of those, all of those things. And we also have a lot to learn or relearn about how we live in relationship to the earth. So the current first Holos location is here in the Diamante Valley, as you mentioned, and it's like the most pristine, unbelievable landscape. I, I kind of like want to just just walk with you and, and talk yeah. about what's happening here because like it's profound how beautiful this place is. And mm. I know that this is part audio, part video, but, you. you know, we're in this pristine valley called the Diamante Valley and there's this this Buddhist teaching, the Om Mane Padme Om, which is the Mm -hmm. jewel in the center of the lotus. And the Diamante is named after a 600-foot waterfall uh, called the Diamante Falls. And Costa Rica, I think of as the lotus. So, like, the Diamante is right here in the center of the lotus of Costa Rica. And we have an abundance of water and waterfalls. This region is really known for waterfalls. So, at Holos, we have about two kilometers of the Diamante River that we're stewarding. And so we have a conservation corridor there. And then up from that, we have a residential community with about 30 lots. And so people are starting to build their houses and practitioners and, uh, yeah, just people that believe in this mission are moving here. And then on the ridge, um, which is just right now a glamping retreat center, we have 
like 10 tents, a yoga shala, and uh, it's this it's this beautiful ridge right in the middle of the Diamante Valley, kind of in the center of the mandala of this whole valley. And so we've been running retreats up there. We have a yoga shala, dining hall, kitchen, clamping setup, and that's what we call base camp. And base camp basically means this is the beginning of us climbing the mountain of what Holos will be in the future. And our next uh, step in the process of building out this retreat center is now that we have some retreats running, we have some capacity, we've planted a fruit forest with thousands of fruit trees. Our next step is to build the core of the retreat center, which is a temple, uh, 12 guest rooms, and a guest house that has four bedrooms. And we've been working with this really amazing architecture firm, Arquitectura Mixta, out of Tulum, Mexico. And also uh, with the uh, folks that were associated with the Bali Green School. So we have been working with bamboo, which is a very sustainable material. And we've been really trying to weave in the traditions of what's local with what's possible. So we brought in uh, somebody from Bamboo University in Bali and an architect from uh, Tulum, Mexico. And we trained the Tico people, the, the local Costa Ricans, how to build these really beautiful structures by bending bamboo with fire and, and using sacred geometry principles to, to build these structures that hold people's healing. And so all throughout the process, we have the mission of education and healing. And uh, so I'm really happy with where we're at, but we're at the very beginning and I'm excited for this next 12 months as we build out the temple and the guest rooms that are more like, I mean, they're nice. They're very nice accommodations. So, yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing and, and giving that tour. Um, it's funny. I was telling Ian Michael how I was, I was actually in the region for a few months this uh, earlier this year and I was supposed to go by there and I have friends that have been there and friends that have actually helped um, co-facilitate retreats there at Holos and I've heard nothing but great things. So thank you so much for yeah. sharing. The Diamante Valley is um, yeah. not only beautiful, but what I really loved is the community. It's just this tight community with a big vision for the world. And I, I made jokes because I'm like, how do I have more friends here in two months than I've had in uh -huh. years where I currently live? So. I will be yeah. spending a lot of time there this winter again. Um, so thank you so much. You know, the question that comes up for me and a lot of people is, um, how, what are the realities with the financing? And, you know, do you have investors? Because, of course, you know, I, I, I personally have this dream. And I'm like, well, I guess if I save and, you know, sell my house and, nah, 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 and get an investor, maybe then I can do it. But this is always the number yeah. one problem is what is the reality of raising, raising capital for a project like this? Yeah. Our seed, our seed round of raising capital is $6 million. And right now we're about two thirds of the way through it. So it's like a slow iterative process of finding the right aligned investors, people that really believe in what we're doing. Some of those are, I would say, more traditional kind of like funds, but not traditional in the sense that they also support psychedelic work. And then about uh, half of the money that we've raised is from individuals that just really believe in what we're doing and have the means to support it. So we've made a good a good dent in, in our, our first seed round. And then secondarily, we have pre-sold uh, about 10 of the 30 lots that we have here. So that's the like other strategy is very slowly, mostly word of mouth. We're opening the doors to people living here as well. So when I lived at Esalen or other retreat centers, one of the things I realized is there wasn't a great opportunity for people to be there long term. So what, what we're trying to create here is these different uh, ways that people can engage with this really sacred place. There's like people can come for a couple days, stay on the ridge. People can come for a week, be in a retreat, or people could be here for a lifetime and stay in a, and have a home. So, yeah, it's a really beautiful, beautiful journey. Yeah. Wow, incredible! Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, it's um, you know, this is the dream for so many people, and you know, I guess maybe me working in the space and also traveling to, um, you know, dietas and retreats for many years, you know, I, I've seen, I've seen the whole gamut, right? You know, like the high end and then the, the Tombow out in the open with tarantulas next to me. Um, yeah. 
So what do you say, this This is a question I've always wondered, is what happens when, especially in Costa Rica, Mexico, um, you know, South America, there's more and more retreat centers popping up. And then there's now these, you know, like um, the places like Rhythmia, they're a little maybe more like medical model. Um, you know, I don't personally believe in competition. I don't believe there is such a thing. But, no. you know, what do you see as the future for how retreats are going to be, you know, used by our society and then also accessibility, because let's yeah. get real here. Um, I'm grateful enough to be able to afford them, but they are not cheap. Most of them. Yeah. Yeah. Our model is that we have scholarship positions that people can come into. And we also have worked with nonprofits that end up like sponsoring people to come or there's a lot of different opportunities for people of, of different economic means to participate in a Holos retreat. Um, but it's, it's real. Like the, the cost of running a retreat center is much higher than a lot of people think. It's like this really sexy idea, but the reality of the finances of running a retreat center is they're very tight businesses. So these are really passion projects and you can make a living and you can provision a lot of people. Um, but it's not like the kind of returns that investors would get if they invest in a tech company that goes really well. So it's a different, like it's a different proposition. Um, and yeah, we try to create as much like impact on the local community and anybody that comes here as possible. So like our workers, we've invited them to peyote circles when we invite somebody down from Mexico um, or you know, there's a lot of different ceremonies that they've been invited to, but we also do all kinds of different training that helps to um, just increase their quality of life, increase their education of health and well-being. So that's like one way that we're able to give back. So by having a center that is like well-provisioned and that people do pay, you know, three to five thousand dollars for a week. Um, that money is able to support all these other initiatives. Mm. Yeah, no, this is a this is an important model and discussion to be having because it's come up for so many people, especially in the the medicine, the psychedelic world, you know, at least here in the US where there's now psychedelic assisted therapy, but it's it's also, you know, quite unreachable for a lot of people, right? You know, $1000 a yeah. pop or a few thousand right. for a full round of ketamine. Um, you know, the accessibility is is definitely an issue and giving back to um, the indigenous communities or, you know, where the medicine comes from. I'm curious, you know, has that come up around the work that you're doing? Because I, I think, I, I assume, maybe I'm wrong, you're working with um, mostly ayahuasca there or is it all kinds of medicine? And how do you give back to, you know, yeah. the communities that provide it? Yeah, so we're working uh, with three medicines primarily, with ayahuasca, San Pedro, and psilocybin. And we have an uh, uh, alternative medical license that's in review right now. So there's a few centers in Costa Rica that are legitimately doing this above board, and we're one that, that are on that track. So um, the way that we give back is, is mostly through our practitioners. So like uh, an example is like Don Moises, who we work with, who's from mm -hmm. Peru. It's like really supporting the initiatives of what he's doing in his local community in Peru, as well as, you know, like paying him well when he comes here and supporting his his medicine cultivation. So that's like the, the way of reciprocity that we most actively see. We also sponsor a lot of elders from other traditions, psychedelic or non-psychedelic, to come to Costa Rica because we really feel like this is a place where that prophecy of the eagle and the condor happens, where if we bring together the elders of the of the north and the south and from all these traditions, that something is going to birth that is going to help realign humanity to, to truth and to nature. Mm, beautiful, yeah. Um, you know, one one question I'm curious about, because this has come up for me, um, you know, as someone who's done a lot of silent retreats and meditation, Vipassana, dietas, and it's it's been my saving grace. Um, in the busy world that we live in, you know, I, for me especially, it's like online entrepreneur. I'm on a computer most, most of the time. Um, I try to be off the computer as much as possible, but it's such a reality that, you know, my body, my nervous system craves this disconnection and just 
pure immersion in silence and nature and connection. Um, you know, what do you, what do you think the future is for retreat centers and like the, our society when it comes to this? Like I, I have been personally saying for years that there's going to be a day where it's like humanity needs to go on silent retreats. <laughs> like, you know, humanity yeah. is going to need to disconnect, especially the more we're moving towards this, you know, people, the transhumanism, and I don't even want to get into all that, but you know, this, this world that we're entering into of the, the metaverse and it's like, well, yeah. how are we going to balance this out? You know, it, the more this is happening in our society, the more I just want to run away, you know, I'm like, maybe I should just disconnect, yeah. pull the plug and go a hundred percent into nature and nothing else. But you know, I can't do that right now. Not yet. But um, well, yeah, what is your what is your vision for this? And what is your you know response to this question about like the future of how this is going to play in play into our society? Well, I have that impulse that you just described sometimes as well, you know, like, oh, I don't want to get on another Zoom call or have another <laughs> meeting. I just want to go disappear into the jungle and never come back. There's like yeah. something visceral and elemental and primal that like, that is yearning to be expressed and yearning to experience itself through us. And so there's like little ways that we can cultivate that. You know, you may live near a park, even if you're in New York or San Francisco, it's like there's little ways to get enough nourishment for our, our wild animate soul that, that I think that there's, there's hope, you know, like I was in LA a week or so ago and just, like going down to the ocean, having a moment of stillness, feeling the breeze, like feeling that sense of the expansiveness. It was like, okay, that's enough for me to have that tether point to nature. But yeah, humanity is in trouble in terms of its level of isolation. So it was interesting. The pandemic really illuminated two things for me. One, how how unhealthy urban environments are and how isolating they can be. And then also the need for, for stillness, like what you just described. It was like that was a huge opportunity for humanity to pause and to like reflect and to have that stillness. So I think that there's practices that we all can incorporate into our lives that, that bring those two things to life, the stillness, the ability to just like be with one's own interiority and and then also to be connected to the wider wild world that that is the reality we live inside of but we've created all of these insulators and all of these intermediaries between us and the primary experience of being human which is a sensory experience like being human is eating and touching and making love and like breathing so we've forgotten because we're so connected to these devices and we're insulated by our homes. And so my hope is that through our retreats, through my life, through everything we're building, we can start to soften that, that intermediary. We can start to soften people into the direct experience of life itself again. Mm. Yeah, no, that that that's the vision I I hope for and pray for every day too. Um, and I I do think, you know, it's kind of like you've said, it's like it's viscerally inside of us. Like there's just this this feeling, you know, that we can't be connected to a computer all day every day. It's like I think even young people are starting to realize, like, okay, they've grown up on video phones and Instagram and just connected since day one, which you know, I haven't. So it's like, it's still considered like this new novel item to me, you know, cause it wasn't, it didn't exist in my childhood. Um, yeah. but I do believe that, yeah, there's going to be more and more of this wanting to come back and really be in that connection. Otherwise, you know, it's like the nervous system fries and we're just, you know, overloaded and, um, isolated and depressed and anxious and, you know, I keep saying this is the whole uh, discussion with psychedelics being this this like remedy and this instant magical cure for depression. I'm like, well, actually, we need to get to the root of what what's actually, you know, causing the depression. It's not the depression. It's what's beneath it all is the, the ultimate disconnection from 
from spirit and earth and self. Um, so I want to change directions a little bit and ask you about something that's come up for, for me, a lot of my clients um, as a retreat attendee. And I have a lot of clients who are psychedelic integration coaches or people that do coaching and are also on the medicine path. So when I have attended some of these really incredible transformational retreats, or for me, it's been dietas in, in Peru with the person I work with, where I've come back to real life, you know, reality, and it's it's been challenging. Um, even as someone who has, I personally have a regular integration practice, you know, somatic therapist, meditation practice. I live on beautiful, you know, three and a half acres of land. But it's always challenging, and people talk about the the dips after these really transformational retreats. Does Holos have anything um, in place around this discussion with integration? Like, how does someone go from an experience at Holos back to, say, San Francisco and their tech startup job? Yeah. <laughs> Without, no, a, without hitting a depression afterwards, right? Yeah, it's a big contrast, you know. It's like one way that I look at the psyche is it's like uh, this membrane of awareness. And so when we have a psychedelic experience or go have a novel experience in another place, an experience of awe, it's like expanding our our awareness of what's possible inside of us. And then... And then that contraction back into the normal patterns that we have been living inside of can be very jarring. And so it's, it's, we have a lot of different ways that we help people to, to, to ease that transition. One of the things that we're wanting to do here and the reason we're building this like a village is somebody could go through a retreat and then have a few days or a week or a month where they could stay on the property, but in a house or up on the ridge, uh, just to like land and to, to be ready for that transition back into their day-to-day -day reality. So that's one thing. But in the retreats that we have been running, you know, I find that community is what really helps to hold that thread. So I think that what I understand at least is a lot of the indigenous traditions, you know, the medicine work was happening in the context of community. So when you take that out of the context of community, you have a whole nother psychological layer that's missing, which is like, you know, the container, what people talk about is like the holding environment or the container was already built into the structure of their village or their, or their society. So in this world where we're like, there's a lot of digital nomadicism or people are in their own little isolated lives in an urban environment. They don't have that sense of interconnectedness and support that psychologically is like the womb or like the mother being held. So when you've come through a really powerful experience, you're like, you potentially become like a newborn baby where you're like trying to reorient to the world. And so we hold people through that by cultivating community. And so that's one reason that we really like doing group work. You know, most of the work that we do is in a retreat setting so that the group becomes part of the integration mechanism. So we have, you know, group Zoom calls. We also do one-on-one -on -one support for those that are really needing it. Um, but part of our, or and part of our longer term vision is that we're able to create like an online sangha or online community that is able to support people because from a practitioner standpoint, following somebody through the arc of their whole healing journey is a lot of attention and, and dedication. And it, and it can become expensive also for that person. Like if they're having to, to track integration sessions every week or every couple of days, whatever it is. So what I really see is that the role of community is going to become more and more important as, as this um, psychedelic revolution unfolds and that people have others that have gone through similar experiences that can say, Oh no, you're not going crazy. This is just you bumping up against the systemic challenges that are already existing, whatever it is, you know, like we all have our different circumstances of, the way that the systems of society are in place are actually very oppressive or traumatic. So we just start to notice more acutely what within the system that we've been living in is traumatic or abusive. 
or is is not healthy for our nervous system we have like another level of acuity and another level of sensitivity that we go back with so there's an education that has to happen for people that you know it's like it will be an adjustment some people actually do it really well like i, I mean i would say 70 80 percent of the people that come through retreats at holos like they're well prepared to go back to their lives and they do it really well but that 30 percent or 40 percent is really significant those that have that that leap back into life that is a pretty big jump for them so we're doing everything we can to create like the support network and and the practices that are going to give people that strength to to re-navigate their lives so yeah eventually we want we are looking actively for the right digital partner the right the right team the right company that's already out there that can help us create this this system of practices and community that are going to bolster people back into their lives mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Community has come up so much, especially the last couple of years of, you know, seeming isolation. Um, so many people I know have said, like, I'm trying to find my community or find my tribe or, you know, even people that live in cities feel super disconnected. Like, I don't have community. Um, I mean, it's come up for me and I do have community and I still am like, I want more community or I want more aligned community or I want... Um, this big vision I have that's, you know, maybe it just takes time, but you know, it's come up so much in the last few years. What do you think is at the root of this? Like, you know, at least, at least especially here in the Western world or in America, so many people feeling that, that feeling of like, I have no community, although we're, you know, glued to our phones, there's online communities, there's yeah. social media like what what is going on like what is what is at the root yeah. of this do you think i i mean some of it could could be developmental so i think a lot of us like um maybe never had the full imprint of like being really safe and seen so like it it, it could be that a lot of it is is cultural a lot of it is because um, the way that our our systems are set up the way that like our families are set up we don't get the, the mirroring and the like really the holding environment that we wanted. Or maybe we had that mirroring and we had that love and really being seen. Um, but now it's so absent in like a very real connected way. You know, I, I really think that it's pretty simple. Like people want to be loved and, and seen. And so when you when you interact with someone that hasn't had that or has a deficit of that or has a story or an experience where they weren't loved and seen, there's like this yearning. And when it's like at a, at a degree that you're talking about where it's like that yearning is there, we want the community. It's like, that's totally normal and healthy, but it can go to levels where people act out because of that need, because that need becomes so great to be loved and seen and, and cared for then it acts out in a myriad number of ways that can be sociopathic or narcissistic or all of these different things. So I think it really comes down to the, the simple human need of wanting connection. You know, it's like we need food, water, shelter, and we need connection. Like it's a very basic human need. And I think that we want it in a way that our five senses or six senses can really feel. So sometimes it's not fulfilling enough to have it through a Zoom call, you know, or to have it um, through, yeah, it's, it's like we, we want the, the deep human embodied experience of being connected with another. Mm, yeah, no, that's, it's, I mean, for my path, that's what's come up so much is like when I started to really recognize and go deep into like, what are these core wounds and these patterns that I've been carrying since childhood or even ancestry? that is making me feel, you know, disconnected or I don't belong or I don't belong on earth. You know, it's like so many people have said this. Um, and over the years of, of deepening into this practice and really going inside and saying like, oh, okay, this is just a patterning. And it's, you know, like you use the word story, the story that I've made up about how the world works and what my place is. And once I deepen this connection with myself, with spirit, with, with the earth, 
with the beings all around, it's like, well, you know, then I realize like it's, it is human connection, but it's like, we're connected in so many various ways that this can be. And, and I personally have had, you know, the medicine has aided so much on this path, you know, to aid in seeing this and understanding that it is well beyond just having a partner or having a group of friends or, you know, people that you get along with or hang out and have fun with. It's like, well, wait a second. Like, what about this deeper inside connection in this world right now? We're seeing so many people projecting into the external, you know, like external, external, like everything's wrong in the external. And that's, that's my prayer with the medicine is like, okay, if we're turning to psychedelics to help us with all this healing, it's like, well, how are they really helping us? It's not just masking the depression. It's like, well, we need to face these deep wounds that are really uncomfortable, you know? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Which, which actually brings me to this question is, um, what are people going to Holos for? Like, is this for, you know, the entrepreneurs who want to optimize and make a huge impact in the world? Or is it for people that are, treatment resistant depression and they don't know where else to turn. I'm curious, like what's, what is your main audience there? Or is it a mix of all of the above? It's a mix of all of the above. We have four tracks of programming. So it's, uh, the acronym is HEAL, H-E-A-L. And uh, the H stands for healing. So some people come for personal healing, whether it's because they've got cluster headaches or depression or anxiety or relational challenges, you know, like that is all one big cycle. And and a lot of retreats are focused on healing. The next uh, track is education and ecology. So the E is we've had retreats where people learn about what it is to live locally or to have your food system local or learning about how to grow entheogenic plants. So There's a lot of different things that we're developing in the education track. The A is artistry. So we've run medicine retreats that are focused on exploring your creativity and expressing yourself and had visionary artists here um, or music and and that kind of expression and voice activation. And then the L is leadership. So that's the retreats that more people that are focused on an entrepreneurial path come to. But I would say that every one of our retreats has components of all of those things, healing, education, artistry, and leadership. And leadership can also just mean leading your own life. Like we're all have the opportunity for leadership when we wake up in the morning and we decide like, this is the way that I'm going to structure my day. This is where I'm going to put my attention. That's leadership. So yeah, we, we run a lot of different programming. And I would say like half of what we're doing right now is is programmed internally by the Holos team and our team of facilitators that we have globally. And then about half of the retreats where we have right now are people that just buy out the space. And we have a vetting process where people can apply to run a retreat here. And so we've got a really beautiful lineup of people renting out the space this, this fall and and coming year. I was going to ask about that if if people like me could just run a retreat or, you know, do I'm curious if, you know, let's say someone like me wanted to run a retreat, yeah. but I wanted it with medicine. I personally do not facilitate any medicine work other than my own once in a while. Um, yeah. Do you provide that like a skilled yeah. trained facilitator of sorts? Exactly. Yeah. So we have a team of facilitators with all of those medicines that have both. uh, We always make sure that there's a pairing or that there's a team involved that has some Western psychological background as well as an indigenous training or like some form of traditional training. So, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, we're trying to merge all those worlds um, because there is value in all of it. Great. No, that's beautiful. Um, Okay, so this is a a deeper question I've asked a lot of guests, um, you know, over the years. Being in the the medicine world and having a deep relationship with these healing plants and psychedelics and also, you know, other expansion of consciousness, um, what do you think the future holds for this growth in psychedelics and this interest and the explosion that's especially happening over the last few years? Um, Where is this taking us and what is your... You know, what is your theory as to how this will actually truly shape us as a world? I mean, is this like the whole, you know, do you believe there will be a day where everybody on this planet has, you know, 
worked with psychedelics more than once. And then like, we've just, you know, had a complete shift in consciousness or, you know, is this going to affect the way we actually um, live in right relationship with the earth? Are we actually going to be able to, you know, fix all the world's problems? I mean, what are your, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I would say that um, I am optimistic and also I have the lens of, of how deep the intergenerational trauma is and, and how deep some of the thought patterns are that people are living inside of. And so I look at these things in terms of, of cycles, and some of those cycles are shorter term and some of those cycles are longer term. So there's always been these, uh, these moments in time where there's been an emergence of, of practices or traditions that that a large number of people subscribe to, and it does shift the way that that civilization expresses itself. So, you know, like all of the different, you could call them medicines or substances, have had like an arc and where they express themselves. So there's all these different traditions of ayahuasca. They have expressed themselves in a myriad number of ways in the Amazon. The, the expansion of alcohol has like expressed itself in a myriad number of ways, some of it really detrimental. So I don't see any of this as like the panacea where it's like, oh, you know, maybe I had the idea when I was first taking LSD as a teenager that it was like, oh, if everybody had LSD, this would be great. The whole world would be solved. But I or all the problems of the world would be solved. I, uh, I guess, have grown some wisdom over time or I've observed enough that I've realized that's definitely not the case and that psychedelics aren't for everyone. So, you know, it's really contextual to somebody's, like, predisposition, um, yeah, pre-existing, like, structure of, of how they see the world and then also the context that they're in. So I don't see psychedelics as, like, being this widely adopted way that we elevate consciousness. I think it's like one of the tools within a myriad number of tools, including different religions and spiritualities and yoga and other practices uh, that will start to raise the level of awareness overall. Um, but I also think that the trajectory that we're currently on as a species, our way of learning is more going to be like the, the school of hard knocks where we, we learn to uh, adjust our course because we have to, because we're forced to by nature and by the balancing act that, that is this planet. So uh, I think psychedelics will be one of the tools that, that help to open that up. But in terms of like a utopian world where everybody has taken psychedelics once in their life, I don't, I don't subscribe to that. My hope, at least like more specifically for the psychedelic revolution in the West is that it doesn't lose its connection to the indigenous knowledge and the importance of ceremony and ritual um, because it is very easy to reduce healing down to a molecule or a chemical process in the brain. But I think that it misses the whole, the whole tapestry of the rainbow of, of what it is to be human. And so like we can, we can maybe solve one thing with one molecule and it's very effective, but it's not the whole picture. So uh, my hope is that the dialogue stays open in how we support these more indigenous traditions and the use of plant medicine as a part of the, a part of the totality and each, each of them have their place. Aho. That's, that's all I have to say to that. I mean, that's, I, I agree. This is so much my prayer and it's, it's something that comes up so much on this podcast is around, um, you know, these, these medicines are not just this magic bullet that are, as I always refer to it, there's so many humans looking for the Amazon prime effect of we want it now, you know, without, without going in, without doing the work. And this, it's the same as above, so below. It's the same as all the problems we face as a species. We can't just, um, 
metaverse it away, you know, like, or, or whatever. I mean, I, I don't even want to, I can't even open that conversation up, but yeah. thank you so much for sharing. Um, the last question, I want to give you an opportunity to share anything about, um, Holos, what you have upcoming this year, where people can find you, anything you want to promote, yeah. let us know. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, like we talked about, our first site is here in Costa Rica and our doors are open and this fall, we have a full set of programming that we've put together. Some of it is available on the website, which is holos.global. Um, also, following us on Instagram, holos.global is a really easy way to keep up with what we're doing and what's happening here. Um, yeah, I would say that the, the easiest way to really get to know this place is to come because um, so many people are like, uh, interested in what we're doing, but then when you actually experience it on the on the land, it's a whole nother uh, whole nother level of power. So we have tours for people that are interested in in purchasing land and living here. Um, sometimes we have overnight stays that are available, and then we we run retreats three to three to four weeks out of the month. So um, yeah, it's. It's moving. I mean, right now we're taking a little break because we're assessing how much we're going to invest in building out this new retreat center. But we're just finishing up a retreat today, and um, things are things are beautiful and building. And we also intend this fall to start a volunteer program so that people that would like to come stay in a tent in our staff zone can come and they can help with the farm and learn from the local Baruka people or yeah, help with a, a myriad number of things. So. I want to come and volunteer. <laughs> Maybe <Yeah>. I will. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ian, Michael. Uh, everybody, we will have the links right here in the show notes. Be sure to follow them on Instagram. And yeah, especially if, you know, this is one of the reasons I invited Ian, Ian Michael on is because I have friends that have actually um, collaborated or, you know, facilitated retreats there and have said nothing but positive things. And of course, we have a lot of people we know in common in that the valley in that region and that, that particular region has been very magical for me. So, you know, out of all the places I recommend, Holos Global is definitely one of them. Although I have yet to be there myself, but definitely this year. Yeah, absolutely. I look forward to when you come down. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, great to see you. Thank you so much. <laughs>